Welcome to the regular scheduled school board meeting, Cheyenne Mountain District 12. Today is Monday, April 24th. We are going to go ahead and start. Can I have a motion to approve the agenda? I move to approve the agenda as amended. Second. All in favor? Aye. 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 Excellent. Let's start by seeing the Pledge of Allegiance together. <laughs> I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. All right, Liz, do we have any visitors signed up to speak this evening? We do. We have Mr. Jim Bensberg. Welcome. The discussion item is School Finance Act. All right. Well, thank you, Mr. Chairman, members of the board, and uh, those who can be present with us, Dr. Peak. Um, I'm a longtime resident of Mountain Mountain School District 12, and as you know, I've recently corresponded with you, Dr. Peak, and the board about uh, possible reimbursement by the state legislature for the costs incurred during the name change. And uh, after my trip to the Capitol today to meet with my representative, Mark Snyder, and my state senator, Bob Gardner. I don't know that we're any closer to a conclusion on this issue. We're told that the uh, money that we were um, reporting on earlier from uh, the Yuma School District had been stripped out of the so-called long bill, Senate Bill 214. But the bill before the Senate Appropriations Committee today was Senate Bill 287, the School Finance Act. And it wasn't clear, even after talking to Senator Gardner, who serves on that committee, whether there will be any money made available separate from the best uh, capital improvement program. So um, I was wanting to just press upon you my interest as a local taxpayer who just got some assessment news today on our property in Cheyenne Canyon. <laughs> Um, I'm keen to see the uh, uh, middle levy stay uh, low and that the uh, district uh, exhaust every avenue that you can through CASB or CEA or whatever other avenues you have. I'm, I'm told the August group uh, represented um, uh, the uh, what, uh, district uh, um, school uh, folks at that state. Why am I? I'm having a time here. The, the education committee or no, the, the, the Department of Education. Oh, the Department of Education. Uh, yeah, yeah. I'm just, you know, legislators, not departments. Oh, there we go. So at any rate, the Department of Education is uh, represented by a group called the August Group, and they have a person named Mellow, uh, I believe is her name. I don't think there's any relation. At any rate, uh, I just wanted to report on that and uh, let you know that I'm, I'm keen to see you all exhaust every opportunity to see the state money if it becomes available. I'm told that there's 26 schools that are possibly eligible because they were um, forced to change their names and, and uh, has an unfunded mandate to uh, put on them on these changes. So if you have any questions for me, I'd be happy to answer. All right. Appreciate you sharing your, your thoughts and information on that. Okay. Thanks for being an advocate for schools. Yes. yes. Well, I'm, I'm keen to see what happens uh, next to my alma mater across the uh, street from the junior high. And what so. we need them to do is we need them to increase the amount that's in the School Finance Act right now. So I don't think 300000 is going to go very, very far. far at all. Yeah. So that's what we need to advocate for. Is yeah, no, that, that amount they for need sure. They hear from everyone yeah. else involved. Yep. Yeah. They've already heard from me. They have. Don't worry. <laughs> Thank you. Well, I'm glad you're on. Thank you. Thank you. So Thank you. Much. <clears throat> <clears throat> there are no other visitors signing up. All right, perfect. All right, board member, member, superintendent correspondence and comments. Anything from the board? Yes, sir. I do have one. Um, we are this close to sending out the leadership team survey. It's resting in it's Russ's hands right now. now. Um, <laughs> but all I know, right? So we're this close to doing that. Um, Susan and I have gone through final revisions. And I think tomorrow, actually, we'll be really close to being able to send out the survey for the Board of Education. Um, and since last year, we revamped the survey completely. 
we went back through, cleaned it up, really made sure that what leadership team was asking was well within their purview. They were asking the right questions about Dr. Peak and not his delegates. And same thing with Board of Education. We've shortened it down to some core elements and just thinking about, are we moving our ball forward in the right direction? So keep your eyes posted for that because we expect 100% 100% participation, holy cow, um, (laughs) from all involved because feedback is incredibly important. So that's my update. Excellent. That will fill out tomorrow. You heard it here I first. have one nice um, comment. I in a job that I have a different hat in one of my other jobs. I heard from my dean that he was visiting with Dr. Peak and Mr. Parker this last week, and just was really had a really enjoyable conversation. And he was so glad to be connected to the community and appreciative of that connection. So, thank you. Excellent. Thank you. I have nothing. Do we have anything from directors Mel or Case? All right, Dr. Pete. I know we have a pretty lengthy agenda, so I'll keep my comments with some brevity. <clears throat> and I apologize in advance. I'm kind of struggling with a little bit of head cold. Uh, yes, thanks to Mr. Parker and meeting uh, uh, with your dean. That was wonderful. Uh, okay. So a uh, couple of uh, highlights. Uh, high school won the Cactus Bowl. So I think there's a shout out to Miss Mello's son, Harry, and others who were a part of that team. Uh, high school also uh, just had the uh, uh, students that are now representing the Congressional Art Competition. It's the People's Choice Gallery, which is open, and you can vote for your favorite piece. All the work is on display at the Color Springs Airport. There's also a web link that I can share with you, uh, but this is uh, part of uh, – uh, Doug Lamborn's um, promotion, I believe, and sponsorship, and open a reception on Friday, May 5th at 5 p.m. Uh, Battle of the Books is coming soon, uh, and team competition, I believe, is starting in Thursday. Thursday. Yep, I think Thursday, Battle of the Books. Uh, Skyways, uh, the Limit Marathon, some of you came out uh, recently, continues every Tuesday and Thursday mornings at 7 a.m., Final mile celebration will be at the high school on May 23rd at 9 a.m. So if you can come, I know that's a great experience. Uh, they also have their barn dance coming up. There's lots of more activities going on. Uh, end of year regular season is fast approaching for our athletics. Uh, and uh, most sports wrap up uh, the end of first week in May. And it looks like as of right now, uh, all of our teams are qualifying for the postseason. Um, baseball, boys, lacrosse, and girls tennis are all ranked in the top three in the state. And uh, the art, I just want to also give a shout out to the, uh, what did we call, what, what did they call it, the art show? Interactive art. Exhibit. Interactive art exhibit. Celebration. I just, uh, a kudos to Dr. Aldridge and especially to our incredible art teachers. Um, this is all with 2D, 3D art, ceramics, painting, the like. Just an incredible turnout. Uh, literally hundreds of folks showed up, families doing interactive, and then a big uh, big presentation. So that was pretty spectacular. So that's about it. Sorry, I have two more things. Yes. <laughs> um, Skyway doing the little handing out the sticks for the marathon thing. So fun. <laughs> that is fun. Right? It was so fun. <laughs> um, and I just wanted to let you guys know that Susan and I have been asked to do a session at the next CASB. Um, conference in the fall on onboarding new school board members. Very nice. Yeah. I can't think of two more qualified people, so congratulations. Thank, thank you. Thank you. Plus, you'll be able to give some real-time experience. Seriously, that, real-time so experience. That'll be good. All right, next item on the agenda is approval of consent agenda. Can I have a motion, please? I move to approve the consent agenda. A second. All in favor? Aye. 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 All right. New business. We have the celebrity chair of the DAC committee here with us tonight, Steve Parker. You're going to uh, talk to us about some bylaw revisions for the DAC committee. Yes, and thank you, board and administrators. I uh, appreciate your time today. Uh, we have two things. I, I want to uh, acknowledge a couple of hardworking committees that the DAC has had. You'll be hearing shortly from uh, Tony Bricker uh, representing the bylaw committee, and he was joined by Jessica Lehman and Rick Flex. So appreciate the work that they've done 
for that. And also you'll be hearing a little bit later from Allison Christofferson, who's leading up the uh, parent survey along with Betsy Kleiner, Carrie Dunn-Clark, Carrie Brenner, and Chris Kilroy. And we uh, really couldn't have accomplished that without the help of uh, Greg Miller and then your three uh, uh, top leaders in the district. They were very instrumental in getting this done. But I know you have a busy agenda, so I'd like to ask uh, Tony Bricker to come up and speak to you about the recommendations we would like your approval on for the DAC bylaw amendments. Good evening, everybody. So uh, most of the changes we made were just uh, modified and added some language to the bylaws for clarification purposes. Uh, but the first major change was art under Article 1, uh, Section 1, Letter E. Uh, the chairperson shall serve a two-year term instead of a one-year term. Uh, over my six years on SAC, I've been with three different chairs, Eric, Kevin, and Steve. And I think after like the first year, they get their legs under them and they start to kind of get the, the deal at all. And we thought it would be really beneficial for them to be able to serve a two-year term and eligible for one re-election. So. And we did that same thing with the uh, vice chair. So, and all the electable positions are now two year terms. So it's consistent throughout. Uh, letter H under the same article, section one, uh, we changed uh, non parent taxpayer to non parent resident. And uh, just to give more people an opportunity to volunteer. So, if they live in the district and might not own a home, but pay rent, they can uh, be on SAC, or I mean DAC. Uh, then we added the one teacher at large, and that is a requirement by the CDE. I know we've had one teacher at large in the past, but it hadn't been on the bylaws. So we put that back on the bylaws. Uh, and then under uh, Article 2, Section 1, uh, duties of the chairperson we added extensively to this. Uh, it was pretty simple and uh, we went to Steve and asked him <coughs> what some of the things he did and we only put a few of them down that were, were definitely requirements of the position. He does a lot more than that, but um, this is pretty straightforward. And uh, duties of the chairperson, we added uh, that they were to pass out uh, DAC minutes to the SAC chairs within four business days. And that was to allow the SAC chairs to use that as their notes for DAC. So they're not a DAC taking all the notes because the SAC chairs also take, typically take the SAC minutes also. So they're doing a lot of minute taking and things like that. So to reduce their, their workload. And really, that's about it. So right now, we're working on the SAC bylaws, the same committee. And what we're finding is that all the schools have different bylaws. So uh, what we're trying to do is make it look as similar to this document as possible. Actually, we've done a lot of cutting and pasting and taking out things that are DAC requirements, adding things that are SAC requirements, kind of using similar language. So we're on the tail end of that, and that should be done at the end of the month. So any questions? You could imagine the number of hands that shot up when they get asked to volunteer for the bylaw <laughs> review committee. It's fun. But these guys have done an amazing job, and it was clearly well past time, and it was Steve's leadership and looking at it saying, you know, we haven't touched these in a very long no, time. No, so. over a decade. Yeah. So it, it was it was time. I, I would echo that as well. And just to add to that, that, I know one of the pieces that we will desire to do once that is updated is also on our website. So I've been working with Greg and Mike Babcock to ensure that once those pieces are fully adopted and streamlined, no matter what, whether you go to the district site or any of the school sites, you'll see parallel information and in links to the updated bylaws. So thank you. So we we'll encourage participation. Yeah, yeah absolutely. Thank you very thank much. You. Thank you guys. Thank you. Thank you. All right. Can I have a motion to approve the bylaw changes? So moved. Second. All in favor? Aye, with thanks. 
Aye. 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 Right. Presentation on the DAC survey results. That's me. Did you want to do the Okay. Come on to the chair, people. Here we go. <laughs> <laughs> Well, thank you for having me. Um, I definitely want to start by acknowledging the subcommittee that worked together with me. So they are sitting here. So we have yes, agreed. Yes, agreed. Uh, Carrie, Chris, Betsy, and Carrie again. Um, so thank you so much to them to um, spending a lot of time on this project. Uh, again, <laughs> as Nisa says, it's probably not the most exciting project, but um, I think it has been uh, well worth it this year. So a um, couple quick previews before we get started. I just want to mention that please feel free to stop me and ask questions at any time throughout the presentation if there's something that you'd like clarification on. I mean, we do have um, some time set for questions at the end, but if there's something you'd like to ask about along the way, please feel free. So I believe that Nisa and I were actually clarifying that you guys uh, will get a full copy of the results of all of the school's surveys at some point shortly. Uh, but today I'm just going to give kind of a high level overview and some trends and comparisons to previous year. Um, but also know that the administration as well as school administrations um, take the results of this survey very seriously and create action plans. So um, there's more beyond just the process that you're going to see here tonight. Um, and lastly, I think we should just recognize that surveying is a tricky business. Um, it can often be a bit subjective, you know, what one person de defines as let's say ready, you know, an independent learner, we're going to get into that question, can sometimes be very different parent to parent. And we did the best that we could to clarify, but um, there are places that we feel like oh, maybe some tweaks along the way might continue to be necessary. So let's get started. Okay, so the first thing I would like to mention um, that you're probably already aware of is that the district adopted a new survey administration tool this year. Greg Miller took on a huge project to convert this survey from being a survey monkey um, administered tool to using Qualtrics. Um, and Qualtrics is kind of an industry standard surveying tool. So it's a great tool, but it's a complicated tool. And I think we learned that um, all along the way and continue to learn that. But with that in mind and the fact that Dr. Peak is now kind of settling in and has had a chance to see the way things have done and now is ready to make a few adjustments we did give the survey a fairly, let's say, a remodel this year. It's a complete change, but definitely a remodel. So a couple of changes to recognize from um, previous years to this year is that in the past, we asked parents to take one survey per child. And parents sometimes felt that that was onerous because you were answering essentially the exact same questions or maybe the same questions with a few minor differences over and over again, and that could feel pretty burdensome. So this year we asked parents to take one survey per school that they had children attending. And as you'll see from our participation numbers, that makes you know, counting participation a little bit squishy, but it also I think helps to make that parent experience um, a little bit better. And then the other major change that we made was just reorganizing the survey. So in the past we had 12 questions and they were kind of you know, every time we add a new question, we just sort of add it at the end, whether it belonged, you know, perhaps belonged closer to other questions. So we organized the survey into six sections this year um, and tried to group questions uh, thematically. And then we left a, a comment box at the end of each themed section. So we had significantly more opportunity for comments this year. I think as a committee, we feel like this is one of those things that we're like, huh, why didn't we do this sooner? <laughs> this has made the results feel a lot easier to understand and a lot more actionable. Just in terms of what you're gonna see in the remainder of this presentation, in the past, uh, SurveyMonkey created bar graphs to help display the answers to survey questions. And Qualtrics creates a different type of report, and that is this kind of dashboard view. So it created a mean score for each of our questions. All questions had a one through five, well, almost all of the questions had a one through five scale. And so like the 4.13 is obviously that mean score of the all of the scores that just the same, obviously, exact answers that you would have seen in the bar graph. And then you'll also see that there's this kind of dashboard view in terms of the red, yellow, green. Um, and so that's, 
you know, obviously we get to decide what is quote unquote green and concerns us or doesn't concern us, but that's kind of Paul Tripp's suggestion of kind of considering if that mean is below four, is it something that needs more attention? So that is what our results are gonna look like today. So in terms of the sections that the survey was broken up into this year, you'll actually see only five listed here, and that is because the last section is the school-specific questions. So schools have the option to add up to three additional questions specific to their school <coughs> program if they want to. Um, only three schools decided to take advantage of that this year, and those questions are really, those answers are being dealt with at the school level, so we're not sharing those results tonight. So we'll just start with these five sections tonight. All right, looking at survey participations. So this year we had 2,401 surveys completed, which is slightly down than la from last year's number of 2,550. However, as I already mentioned, we would have expected to see that minor dip because we were asking parents to take one survey per school rather than one survey per child. So if our school, if our district has 3,717 approximately on any given day <laughs> students enrolled, this would represent about 64% of students having had a survey taken on their behalf. So um, that is similar. Last year we estimated 68%, um, but again, these numbers are a little bit tricky to calculate. Also, not only did we change what we ask parents to do, but there's also parent children who have multiple parent households, so the same kid can be getting multiple <laughs> survey respondents. So it's a little bit tricky, but all in all, this is well above the kind of 50% um, industry standard. All right, so moving into thinking about some survey results. Um, I would say the major theme, much like I told you last year, is no change. And, um, and I mean that in a good way, meaning that we are, this is a common conversation in our district, right? That we're really a very high performing district. And so, you know, when you're up at the top, it kind of is hard to see a lot of um, incremental I'm not change. I'm sure I understand. Oh, you don't need to understand. <laughs> is always listening. I'm sorry. I thought I was going for a walk. That was really weird. All right. So let's start looking at results from this first section, which was academic teaching and learning. So the first question is, my students' academic needs are being adequately met? In my opinion, this is really, in many ways, the most important question because we are a school district and we wanna make sure that we are meeting students' academic needs. And as you can see, no significant change on this question and we are in the green. The next question was, the curriculum is developmentally appropriate for my student? And this was a new question, so there is no comparison available. And again, in the green with a 4.3 <coughs> mean score. The next question was asking, my student on average spends the following amount of time on homework. So I broke this out. Uh, first, you have the district average of 71 minutes per student, and then you have it um, by level. So 115 minutes at the high school, 70 minutes at the junior high, and 41 minutes at the elementary school. And we, we talked last year in this setting about how Teachers often talk about having approximately 10 minutes of homework per grade level. So if you're in the first grade, you might get 10 minutes. And if you're in the seventh grade, you might get 70 minutes. So these numbers do make sense with that expectation. However, this question um, is also a new question and it says the amount of homework my student receives is appropriate. And as you can see, we're scoring a little lower on this question. Um, and the other thing I think we should note is that last year we received 21 comments that were about homework in some way. This year we received 48 comments about homework. And some of those were positive and some of those were negative, right? Um, and so I thought if anybody else from the committee wanted to kind of comment on this, I know at the high school level, we've already really gotten quite intentional about homework. I don't know if you want to comment on that at all. I think it's part of the informational tool that we use for parents to provide them information and students when they select courses. Um, so this year, actually, we took the DAC survey and we created a staff survey and a student <laughs> survey for each grade level. Um, and some of those questions were on um, what type of course they have, whether it was honors or um, traditional course, and then the amount of homework. So. That's a lot of data, so we're synthesizing through that. But again, to be able to provide that information to parents when they're reading through course registration guides to decide, you know, I really want to take honors English, mom. 
gee, it says 35 minutes of homework. You don't like reading that much. You enjoy your sciences better. Let's look at what options are there, right? Or that's a great fit. I can never get you out of a book, right? Um, just being intentional about those and also um, trying to make sure that teachers have time to plan adequate practice, right? Because that's really what homework is um, versus <coughs> just work. So, so um, the theme of many of the comments related to homework was about the expectation of homework in the sixth grade in particular, because it seemed like among the elementary schools, there's kind of a moderate amount of variety of what the expectation is in sixth grade. And um, that was something that our committee kind of discussed quite a bit in terms of is should there be some kind of expectation around not obviously not with a real firm hand about what homework expectations should be at each level or grade level or whatever, but just making sure that, you know, as a district, we have kind of some general thoughts and policies around homework. And um, I think we also talked about the idea that homework is not as a parent, homework is often about, is my child prepared for the next step? So in sixth grade in particular, that's a big concern because parents are really wanting to feel sure that their child is prepared for that next step of junior high. And yet we talked about how um, on the, when they surveyed, I don't know if you want to talk about this, about um, seventh graders, often they have said, oh, the transition was great. <laughs> so I think it may be a little bit of parents having, you know, a fear of the unknown. Yeah, and we've talked about it with and Dr. Peek's talking with all the principals, but it, the, a lot of the comments are about sixth grade parents saying this is too much or not enough in reflection of junior high. But yet when we looked at the junior high survey, did you think the transition from sixth grade to seventh grade was good? They all said yes. So more might not be a, are we not preparing for the next step, but is there a disconnect in that communication? Mm -hmm. I, would, I just think to add one more point to that. It, it, the outcomes are very similar. I mean, if you, if you juxtapose CME and, and Broadmoor Elementary, we do have, we probably represent the 41 minutes and Broadmoor represents zero, but the outcomes are the same. In sixth grade. Uh, in sixth grade, yeah. So there, there is a case to be made for both. Um, and, you know, they're just different philosophies, but there's research to kind of support both sides of that, but the outcomes are similar. And different structure. Because yeah. sixth grade Broadmoor has an access period, much like the junior high does. So that is the time for people to do homework. So it's not done at home. So there's a change in the structure of the schedule to facilitate that. So do you have the breakout across the five elementary schools <laughs> self-reported homework time? I do. It's not in this presentation, but I would be happy to share it with you. It was in the presentation that was shared with the DAC. Um, but let me write that down. If we get a copy of the survey digitally, which we typically get in the past, you can also look think about 27 minutes to 47 minutes mm -hmm. for the entire elementary experience. So keep in mind that included kindergarten to sixth graders. So the lowest school was giving 27 a night for all elementary schools. And the highest was, I think, was 47. And minutes. could you break out where the sixth grade concerns, like which schools were had the most Concerns. Well, and so there was other comments about the sixth grade experience, and we've discussed and talked to some of the principals on why maybe that's coming up. And I think it's because so many sixth graders are now intermingled in sports. And so their parents are on the sideline going, well, I got to go do this project. We're like, you don't do that project. I got to go work on my binder. What do you mean a binder? Oh, we're going to go to do access. And there was just enough vernacular differences, maybe a little bit style, maybe some presentation. And that there seemed to be a big number of comments for all the elementary on like, well, sixth grade should be this or sixth grade should be that. And so again, is this a communication or, you know, maybe a consistency type of thing, which Dr. Peaks already been talking about with some of the principals. We did spend some time at DAC talking about conversations that David is having with principals looking at alignment and just making sure that we're supporting the individuality of the schools, but also with that preparation idea in mind, what do kids really need to know to be prepared to be successful at the junior high? And it's going to vary kid to kid and school to school, but a sense of confidence that they are capable of doing work is hard to measure in homework. Um, but it's, yeah, some people will say my kid doesn't have enough homework and others will say it's too much. And as we know, you know, you can have a kid that has 10 minutes of homework and it takes them 45 minutes or they lock themselves in their room with their device and they now have three hours that they're spending on homework. And 
parents, you know, so there's a lot that goes into this and it's how are, how are we putting the message out? How are we being intentional about what's expected? And this is really good data because we get to see how people are feeling and yeah, what we get to do about it is maybe not as straightforward, but we're asking the right questions. Did we ask the same questions last year and feel like this is a different result than we've got from previous years? So we asked the question last year, how much time does your child spend on homework? So we had in the past, again, we would get that bar graph view. So we kind of had this bar graph showing the number of in half hour increments, what people were estimating their child was spending on homework. We did not ask this question of the amount of homework my student receives is appropriate last year. So this is the first time we are collecting that information. And we've thought about tweaking that question to say, instead of do you think it's appropriate, do you think the amount of homework is A, too much, B, just right, C, not enough? Mm -hmm. Because when they say not appropriate, I don't know if that means not appropriate, too much, not appropriate, not mm -hmm. enough. Yeah, and again, that's where the, you know, the tricky kind of subjective nature of surveying is can be tough. Yeah. And also in answer to your question, Monica, um, we cannot sort by grade level because we made this change to saying we're sorting by school. So if you have a, a second grader and a sixth grader in the same school, then you would be just giving an average for both of those right. kids. Interesting. So it's not, a, you know, it's not super, super accurate. I also wonder... I mean, last year was just such a different year because it was the first year of your wounds back. Like, I wonder if we need to compare, if we're going to really be making these, like, if we're going to make programmatic changes based on these comparisons, if we don't need to look before COVID. <coughs> That's the last time that we had standardized data from a normal school year. That might be too much to ask, but I guess I'm just saying, let's take this with a grain of salt because this year compared to last year are two entirely different things. Although for the yeah, elementary schools, right. stayed, the elementary schools stayed in school for the most part. Yeah, almost. Yeah. So yeah, I mean, my kid missed one day of school. Here, it was still like not a normal year. Like wearing masks, we're not wearing masks. Like was everybody there? Were most people staying home every time they were sick? Were they not staying home? I don't know. People, the anxiety also of everyone, teachers and parents, was at a very different place and may look different now compared to four years ago. I, don't know, I just think it's things to think about. I'm sure it you guys would be did. possible it's... to just get this the same chart if you can go back just one. Greg, thanks. Um, like I could definitely do this, and I could definitely do. Right, you don't have to do it for school. me. Like I just don't want you guys to <clears throat> feel like, oh my god, we have to make these drastic changes because yeah. of last year, this year. Yeah. Well, and actually, Carrie was saying she feels like with the change in the bell schedule that perhaps the concern at the high school level may have be slightly diminished. Right. Um, so, I, I think when you talk about the sixth grade topic, I don't think it's necessarily minutes as much as if Broadmoor CME are just as prepared to move to the next level. And why is it needed or not needed? It's really yeah, and that's I think a, a communication. Yeah. Yeah. I think that's where you get a lot of the comments. Because my sixth grade Broadmoor daughter had no problem going to seventh grade. And so I went and actually talked to the counselor and said, can you tell the difference between seventh grade kids and gold camp kids, you know, and are they performing differently? And so it's, you know, back to Betsy's point, it's more of this anxiety at the sixth grade level yeah. versus the reality of the seventh grade experience. Right. So we might all be in the same conversation that, yeah. you know, do we need to change any of sixth grade? That, that Those are some other conversations, but on the homework piece, mm -hmm. those didn't seem to correlate. We didn't see a big number of homework. And then if we would have seen the transition in seventh grade, like as <laughs> two, you know, then maybe that would have been great. Right. Thank you. Okay, so I think, yeah. So now um, this is about satisfaction with curriculum. So the question is, rate how satisfied you are with the curriculum materials and instruction in the following areas. Um, oh, okay. So here is for all of the elementary schools, averaging or mean it, giving the mean of each of the subject areas. So um, I highlighted the core subject areas. I we probably won't be surprised to hear that PE is the top rated subject in elementary school. Um, but social studies actually fell lowest, but science was the lowest rated subject area in three out of five elementary schools. And as you'll see, it's actually the lowest rated subject area in the junior high and high school as well. So just wanted to note that. So yeah, moving on to the junior high. Again, I have highlighted the core subject areas 
And interestingly, um, Spanish was the highest rated curriculum area and French was the lowest rated curriculum area, which is a bit of a conundrum there, to be honest. <laughs> and then at the high school level, um, again, we have the science is the lowest rated area overall, I believe. Yes, the lowest rated area overall, as well as the lowest rated core subject. Um, and highest area is social studies. So that is kind of an interesting contradiction to the elementary school results. So Chris, did you want to comment a little bit on <laughs> our thoughts on science? I mean, yeah, I think at the, at the elementary level, um, I think what I, I would, I, I can't say this, I'm going to speculate, and this is just anecdotal observations. It's from several elementaries, but currently at CME, I think there's a correlation between the comfort level with the content and instruction and outcomes. Um, I know that the, the sixth graders have made a shift in, in the curriculum, and so that's been an adjustment, but I really do sense that there's a um, definitely a correlation between their sense of like, their, the teacher's sense of mastery of the subject matter. Uh, obviously, when you're passionate about something and that's your area of expertise, imparting that is you know something that you're <laughs> passionate about, but if you're still so to try to wrap your head around it, I, I do think it can have an impact on, on outcomes and <laughs> for the kids as well. Um, so that's, I mean, that's just a working theory, but that's certainly based on anecdotal information. And I believe there were some changes in the adoption of new materials mm -hmm. relatively recently. So that could be one explanation for why this is an area that has some opportunity for growth. We also talked about maybe next year encouraging people to sit down explicitly with their kids yeah, to answer these questions. We added that to the R instruction thing, yeah. Because they didn't do that. And math comes home every day. Reading comes home every day. I actually do hear about fun science things, but if you don't hear about it from your kids and you're not engaging them in the questions, so I mean, they're very hard to answer. And so... Um, it's just what what do you hear about and they might not be talking about science at home and they also vary when they teach it at the lower grades and i think didn't we also talk about the junior high doesn't have a take-home textbook right now so there's also like parents maybe not just seeing as much of the material at home yeah all right so that is the end of the academic teaching and learning section the next section is social emotional mental health and wellness the first question in this section is my student feels emotionally safe at school and um, this one is give or take roughly no change i asked our principals here um, what do you consider like an indicator question like if you what's the first question you want to flip to and you want to see that result when you get these results back and they said that these questions about students feeling safe at school are really important to them in that way because you know if you're not feeling safe then you're probably not doing a lot of learning so i think that we are doing well in this area of students feeling emotionally safe the next question is uh, very similar. My student feels physically safe at school. Um, and again, this is very similar to the previous year, um, even the green, if that, is, <coughs> if that is worth commenting on. And finally, this student says, my student, or sorry, this question has, says, my student has a strong connection with at least one trusted adult. Um, and again, very little change here from previous years and doing well on this question. The next question is more about access to resources. And this question was, my student has access to mental health supports at school when needed. So this, there's no comparable result on this one. This was not a question that was asked in previous years, but um, not quite as high on this, although certainly getting close to a, a mean score of a four. Um, so I think, I think the um, students are feeling, students and parents are feeling that their child is safe, but there's still some, perhaps some work to be done on matching the available resources with the kids who need those resources. You don't have the school breakdown on this one either from elementary to junior high to high school. Was there a variation that struck you guys at all that you remember? Like, was elementary higher? Or do you remember? Comparative. Okay. Okay. I don't know that we compared it. I do know that we saw in several of them, the larger the school, the lower the score, right? Yeah. I mean, that was just on some of them. I can't say for sure in this one, but 
need to be more of a trend by size versus necessarily the question. Mm -hmm. I don't think I had to do this math by hand to get the average from the previous year because we only got bar graphs in the past. So <laughs> I didn't do that by level, but I would be happy to if you're interested in seeing it. We, I can look at it when we get our things. It just was. It's a scary thought that I was doing a lot of math. So <laughs> <laughs> I used Excel. Okay. The next question is, my child feels that they have the appropriate access to resources and supports to be successful at school. Um, again, this is not a comparable question because it's a new question this year. It's within striking distance of a four, um, but again, this is about that match of accessing those resources. <clears throat> and that is all for that section. The next question, the next section is all new questions. So this was a section that David wanted to add. Um, so we don't have comparable data for this next section, but it is about technology, college and career readiness and future learning. So first question was, my student has access to technology and tools to be successful. Uh, my understanding is that this is kind of the first year of full implementation of kind of the technology plan in the district. And I think this question is a particularly difficult one to recognize. We're hearing from parents all the way from pre-K <coughs> to high school. And so how technology is used and how you feel about your child using technology, there's a lot of variety within those experiences. The next question is, technology integration within classrooms is positively impacting my students' learning experience, and that mean score was a 3.94. No comparable results on that one. Next question is, my student is adequately prepared to function independently as a learner. And this is the one that our committee discussed, and we actually kind of all went, well, what does that mean? What does that mean to you? What does that mean to you? And we all had a slightly different definition, and we were like, uh-oh, that's bad survey practice, right, if, it, if there's a little bit of subjectivity. <laughs> so this is probably a question that needs perhaps some tweaking and clarification in the future, but um, we have a mean score of a 3.88 on this one. And again, I think this kind of speaks to that same idea of I want my child to be prepared for what's next. And the next question for this one is, my student has opportunities to explore their interests. The mean score for this is a 3.96. And that is all the questions in that section. So the next section is about communications and operations. And we do have um, comparable scores for most of these questions. So the first question was about communication. And we asked parents, please rate how satisfied you are with the communications provided at the following the following areas in the following areas we have typo um, so you can see this is all the variety of ways that we communicate with parents and asking them how satisfied they are with those variety of ways and we know that the website and the app uh, the website was recently remodeled the app is relatively new so those are areas that um, don't have super high satisfaction but perhaps that's <coughs> kind of early in the adoption curve on those um, and parents rated report cards and text messages as the areas that they were most satisfied with the communication. And our committee talked a little bit about, you know, you really want to match the channel, right? So all these are all channels of communication and the occasion, right? I don't want to get my kids report card via text message, but I do really like to get that reminder that there's a choir concert tomorrow night. So I think, you know, as we think about communication, we need to think about being strategic in the right message and the right channel. And we talked about maybe changing that question as well, saying what me what method you prefer to be contacted on, and maybe even it broken for down. For urgent. Yeah, for urgent, for urgent meaning discipline, you know, got to pick your kid School up right clothes. now. Yeah, or <laughs> not urgent. What would be your preference? Because we noted that there's 12 areas there, and that's a lot of admin and teachers to have mm -hmm. to manage. And so if they could just pick two two places, you know, this is the urgent way you get it, and this is the non-urgent, and so we have that on a redraft for next year. I also think it's funny that report cards are there, because with Infinite Campus, report cards are much less of a thing, and so we didn't ask about Infinite, oh, we did, the yeah, portal. It's on there. And that directly correlates to, if it is much more popular when you get to junior high and high school, where it's more utilized, and it's kind of a pain in the tootie if you're sixth grade and you can't find the absence report, because it's buried, and that's really all that you use it for, at that level. So, you know, 
It's buried everywhere, Betsy. It is buried. <laughs> <laughs> oh, this, this is the first year that four or five and six have buried. Right. Exactly. So yeah. New. new. All right, the next question was, the school building and grounds are adequately maintained, and we had a 4.33 mean score, and um, not a, it's a less than 3% um, change there, so no significant change on that question. The next question was, the current level of campus security provided is, um, so this one, the question was, somewhat comparable, let's say. So for the way we asked the question this year, your answer choices were from very inappropriate to very appropriate. Last year, we asked the question, um, is the survey, do, is the amount of security not enough? You know, too little, about right, too much. Roughly, that was what we asked. <laughs> and 87% of parents said that survey, the amount of security was about right. So this time we had a score of a 4.10 um, and we talked a lot about how security, you don't, on the one hand, you want to tell your story so that parents recognize that absolutely the district does have a plan and in fact the plan has gotten much more um, robust in the last few years. At the same time, if you're too predictable with your security, then you're not very secure. Um, however, I will note that this is an area that last year we also talked about doing a better job telling our story, and we're kind of having that same conversation this year. So perhaps this is an area that we can continue to do work. And that is all for that section. And then the last section here is about just some district-focused questions. And we didn't do a lot at this district level because the, as a committee, when we were preparing the survey, we talked about how really there's very few things that parents experience on the district level, right? Most of the time you're experiencing it at your child's school level. But as a district, we ask parents, please rank the characteristics below, most important to least important, where district administration should focus. This was a drag and drop question. So for parents who didn't take the survey, you, you, you drug the answer to so that you were ranking them from one to seven. So if we compare this to last year's results, the question was slightly different last year. Last year, we asked parents, looking at the characteristics below, select three where the district and administration should focus to improve. So we asked the question a little bit differently. So it's not 100% comparable. Um, but you could essentially say that teaching and learning, which the kind of equivalent, oh, can you go to the next slide, please? So last year, uh, academic support and mentoring is kind of similar to teaching and learning, in parentheses, academics. Um, and then social emotional learning is somewhat similar to mental health and wellness. So you could say that those two have flip flopped. Although I would kind of argue that teaching and learning should always be the top priority of a school district because it's a school district. Um, and the other kind of interesting thing to note here is that college and career readiness last year was the number four rated thing that parents said uh, the district and administration should be concerned about, and that has dropped to number six. So um, I don't know if we want to say that's something that is a lesser priority or if it's something we can pat ourselves on the back and say, hey, we're doing so well with that. It's not something that we feel um, needs quite as much. It's definitely that. OK, great. <laughs> Excellent. But as you pointed out, this is district wide. And so again, there's probably some difference between the answers from an elementary school family or preschool or yeah, preschool yeah, family yeah. and versus a junior high or high school. So it's yeah. Absolutely. All right. So then just to wrap it up, um, we have a couple of kind of key takeaways for you in terms of areas of growth and areas for celebration. So as I mentioned, we had comment boxes available in five out of the six sections and potentially even in six sections if the school questions had comment boxes. So we received about 800 comments and I did code the comments again this year, but I just wanna give you some high level big picture stuff here in this meeting. So some key areas for growth in terms of the kind of more qualitative comments would be this conversation that we've already had quite a bit of about homework being um, still, you know, kind of having that Goldilocks complex about we want it, how do we make it just right? Or maybe how do we make sure that we have <laughs> It's right size to make sure that our kids are prepared for what's next. 
We talked about science, how five, of that, five out of seven schools listed science as their lowest um, satisfaction area. Safety and security, I would say there were quite a few comments on this area, and I think there are many parents that feel that there's no such thing as too much safety and security. And uh, so, and I think, frankly, as a parent, we can all sympathize with that feeling. At the same time, I also think that um, it's an area where we can continue to tell our story, you know, strategically so that we're not compromising security, but also letting parents know what is in place. And then communication, um, thinking about that, making communication timely and also the right channel for the occasion is something that we did hear quite a bit about in terms of saying, you know, oh, I don't want to hear about something at the last minute and and that kind of thing. And, you know, parents wanted to, it's a tough one actually, because I feel like it's very individual preference oriented, but I still think we can have some best practices. And lastly, we did hear um, quite a few comments about behavior issues, you know, which is common. We had, that was kind of a category that I read many comments on last year as well. But I don't know if Betsy or anyone else has comments about kind of the the COVID recovery or the unexpected COVID effects that um, behavior is still kind of bouncing back from. Yeah, I think a lot of the older kids did not have the support and social interactions that they normally would have had. And that has an impact on our kids and their interactions with others. I think a lot of people spend a lot of time on computers um, during COVID and were probably exposed to things that may not have been the healthiest interface uh, for them to be exposed to. And as we reintroduce kids back into schools, those are going to have impacts. On the communication piece, to just to show that the survey, I feel like works as a parent, we had all talked about this at DAC. And literally the next day, Broadmoor sent out a thing saying, by the way, tomorrow we're going to have a lockdown drill, heads up, you know, if you get text about it. And this week, we got an email from the junior high saying, just so you know, there was drug dogs there. Okay. And so those are, I think that was some of the communication. Some of it was on an individual, but, you know, I think to Allison's point, there is that safety concern, obviously, with stuff that's going on in the news and some of that stuff to help, I think, waylay some of the rumors like that already, I think, worked, you know, getting mm -hmm. some of that feedback into practice. Yeah. So you're feeling like you're already seeing a response to the conversation we had two weeks ago. From right? that, yeah. Yeah. Awesome. I mean, literally two schools already where if my daughter were to come home and say, did the same thing for the did they do it? Well, and I'm not, I don't have a high and school. And we had, you know, a potential threat that was also yeah. beautifully articulated by Carrie about we've researched it, things are good to go, you're safe to have your kids. Um, that was, yeah. I think, well articulated and sent out to all parents. Which might also be escalated over the last couple of years. I don't know that you've dealt with that always where parents text each other within six minutes. Everybody had a picture. Do you know what I mean? And now, it's, you know, it is, it is amazing how fast things go. And so I do think that kind of stunt some of those escalations or rumors or whatever. I think that's been really helpful. Six minutes sounds slow. Many more days that come in. Sounds stressful. All right, so those were our areas for growth and then some areas for celebration. One more, yeah. So similarly to last year, the largest category of comments, 20% of the comments we received were kudos, whether it be for the school, from an individual teacher, the district, there was just a lot of positive things to hear and say. And I think we should recognize that when in the survey world, you kind of hear the extremes, right? You hear people who are very happy and you hear people that are very unhappy and maybe not so much in the middle, but it takes an effort to type out that comment, right? I think we've all been through that situation where where you just click, 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 and it's a lot easier to just give those quantitative um, feedback pieces and not give qualitative feedback. So it's pretty remarkable that 20% of the comments were positive. In particular, we had a ton of positive comments about Canyon. Just feel like our littlest learners are being well taken care of, and I liked seeing that. <laughs> I think we did have some positive comments about the additional mental health resources. Um, and, you know, again, I think really the area to think about is just that match between the what's available and getting those kids who need it um, access to those resources. And lastly, if um, oh, I, the other one was 80% of parents agree or strongly agree that their student can identify a trusted adult. So that I think is a really great thing to celebrate. 
And lastly, if we look back actually at that very first question that we talked about, um, the question was my students' academic needs are being adequately met. This is the only one where I showed you the bar graph view because the bars are so high. 86% of survey respondents agree or strongly agree that their students' academic needs are being met and we are a school district. So I think that is really excellent news. Anything else you guys want to add? Exactly three minutes. I'm just saying that's <laughs> <laughs> uh, amazing. <laughs> to the minute. Any other questions? Not a question, but a comment. Uh, I <clears throat> just want to also thank you, uh, Allison, for all of your work and your leadership with this. So, <laughs> and the rest of the subcommittee. And I and also, Ray, I mean, and I want to publicly. <laughs> I didn't have to do the math, well, <laughs> but I no. do think these results will help for the next year. Yeah. Yes. Greg, also thank you for all of your leadership and work in this too. It's a it's kind of it was a heavy lift, a new tool, a new design, a new read model, but I think uh, we're going to head in a really good direction with this kind of information. So I haven't been in your discussions, but I think the only other piece I I can add is if you want that other piece of data back, where you're able to maybe be more granular by grade, then you can give up yeah. the ability to to have one survey now you're asking parents to take as many services as they have kids yeah so the board is aware too i can provide you a copy of the version that dac received which is a little more granular but we were trying to keep this a little bit higher level for the sake of the agenda and other items but i i would be pleased to share with you the version that dac received that we have quite a bit more also in the comments yeah. Also, just to share with you, uh, with the board, that between May 8th and uh, other future work sessions, we will, in the next month or two, we'll digest a little bit more of this and talk about some of the goals, end of year stuff. So, more to come. <clears throat> Apologizing. Sorry, Not John. Not very much. Our little puddle over there. Yeah. <laughs> You're doing great. No. <laughs> <laughs> and, and these results are talking posted publicly on each of our accountability pages. Okay. Um, if you could find a way to advertise how much your parent involvement has gone up in DAC over this year, I think you should do that because this is like really, you have really, Steve and, and Allison and everyone have really done such a great job of engaging more people and making this more meaningful, I think, for, for everybody. So thank you for doing that too. Yeah, I mean, I would say just, you know, to Steve's credit that he's definitely doing a great job of saying we're not just, just going to do things because that's the way it's always been done, you know, asking real questions about is this meaningful? Does this need another look? So I think that's awesome. I'll be letting the state level school and family partnership director know how much you're doing. So good job. <laughs> so he's on me. Thanks. Thank you all. Yeah. 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 All right. Well, we won't be offended if y'all want to make an evening of it. <laughs> Otherwise, we have some roading budget discussions <laughs> and policy. That's our cue. It might be your cue. So there's 20 policies up for review. So if you'd like to stay, we will. Uh, actually, before everyone leaves, if I can just share two with the DAC and uh, members in the board and cabinet and a work just so the board is aware we'll be working with Steve and Allison and Greg on getting now the next phase of this uh, information outward facing right so just know that now post the board meeting we'll be working next on getting this information outward facing so that information can be accessible out to the public are you going to send an all district email on that? Yeah, we'll work on some protocols around the communication where they can go and find that. So coming soon. Yeah, the only add, like thing to add back in perhaps that I took out is like I did kind of a little like, how does a mean work? <laughs> that I <laughs> removed because I imagine that you guys know that, but um, I just think maybe for public consumption, we might want to add that back in just so that it's clear how we got these numbers. So just so the board is aware, we will be public with this. Give us a couple of days to get that put together. But that's that's kind of the next step in our communications with transparency about the feedback that we very much value. So thank you again. Thanks, everyone.
Thanks. Yeah. Natalie, you got some budget for us? My turn. They bust out with an extra three million. We didn't know about last meeting. It's a pattern of being and they're gone. Just for us. Just for us. <laughs> Reoccurring, just for us. <laughs> they call it the shy <laughs> mountain car out. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I just appreciate you always going for this. <laughs> I just want to. <laughs> That's how the big celebration was. That's true. So, I've never had something, right? Exactly. Which of you has the most familiar with the policies of the deal? Depends on which ones. The policy on alcohol. Mm -hmm. Uh oh, I'm just curious. Oh, not in our packet. That, no, we've never. So we always say that that's our policy, but I've never seen it. Um, I didn't hear the question. You want drinks it's at like a meeting? A, drinks at a meeting. Uh, uh, no alcohol on not. school campus. I'm joking. On yeah. district property. <laughs> Perhaps we don't have a policy about that. It was a joke. It was just a joke. Put <laughs> on budget yeah. discussion. <laughs> so, <laughs> you have <laughs> so just a, a quick update on the budget. Um, School Finance Act, as you all know, was introduced today. Um, we were all pleasantly um, happy, happy, I don't know, surprised, but um, that they took out all of the stuff they were originally trying to do with monkeying with the formula. They had taken out a um, reduction of the cost of living factor. They've taken out monkeying with the averaging, anything like that. And um, I think what, what I heard from Case was they really thought it was just going to fly under the radar and that no one was going to push back because we were all getting a lot of money and we were all, we weren't going to pay attention to the details and they were surprised when we all pushed back and said no you can't rob us here in the school finance act to buy down the negative factor right. that doesn't work <clears throat> so um we were really happy with the way that it was introduced and that they took all of that out so the first page just shows a little bit of what you had already seen the last time we talked um so the eight percent increase to the base is still in in the formula now they are trying to buy down the stabilization factor by 150 million as opposed to 120 which i talked about last time and then mr Benson was going to mention that in the act they do have in there the reimbursement for districts who are required to replace the native american mascots and right now that dollar amount set at three hundred thousand dollars into in the act which isn't a lot of money, but I have already schools. I have already contacted CDE and said, "Tell me more about this and what's the plan and what's." The, and they said, "Whoa, Natalie, we don't even have rules yet, so we don't know the process until it goes through." So okay. Did but you first high school qualify? High school would not qualify because we were not forced to do it. We chose to do it before we were told to. Oh. <laughs> ah, but we had been making those changes for years. We did. Like, yeah. We were very yeah. deliberate about it in terms of um, uniforms and when we redid the high school. Like it is a very different. It situation. is just a funny semantic to say you can choose to change or face consequences. So we chose to change, but and, and that's my assumption. I could be wrong by the time this all plays through the school finance act and everything, but that was my assumption. But because we never got the letter that says you're in violation, you have to change. That's my assumption. Uh -huh. I could be wrong about that. It, it is interesting because we were in violation of, I mean, we changed it because because we knew the legislation was changing. Right. <laughs> no. It was the right, thing, the right to thing to do. Thank you. <laughs> Yes. For the junior, but for to clarify, however, by the time the junior high, yes. the junior high came around, the law had already passed. Yes. So that was that was a response with the funders. Yes. And I realized was a response to the law. Impact so the thunder, was much so less. If the logic more. follows of what Natalie is suggesting, we may still have an opportunity at some of those dollars for what we're having to do at the junior high. Uniforms, gym floor, marquee, we have some expenses that we likely will incur. Which, which is <laughs> nice because, you know, you can apply for some stuff through the BUS grant, but that is all capital construction and big right. and has to be approved and there's no guarantee. 
uniforms are one of the biggest things we're replacing as okay. athletics. Yeah. That wouldn't qualify for the best grant. So yeah. if that will qualify here, that will be helpful. Yeah. Okay. We'll get, but 300,000 isn't going to go very far. Yeah. It's all the yeah. districts have had to change the mass. Totally not. But so, I, and I, like I said, they, they told me we don't even know the process yet, Natalie. So hold on. <laughs> so, but that is in there. And then the way the act was introduced, so that would make our peer people revenue just at ten thousand dollars per student, which the last time I brought this to you was at nine thousand nine hundred sixty-seven. So the thing I did different on this front page is I broke out preschool and took preschool out of our numbers, which is why that number looks lower than before. And then I added at the bottom of that the universal pre-K revenue that I'm thinking we're going to get, just so you can see a total total dollar amount of what our potential new revenue will be from the act, so to speak. So then my next three pages are just some scenarios because we're going to come down to the wire again this year as far as what we can do. And we just won't know until the last minute when they finally approve it. But the first page, I have three pages of just different scenarios in here. And this looks just like the same page uh, format that I gave you last time. So the first line item is what our current deficit is that was planned and budgeted for this year. Um, the next line would be revenue for, from the School Finance Act, revenue from Universal Preschool. And then the other thing that's now built in here is the SPED funding. They added the 40 million to tier, tier B students. And we actually got real numbers to sh show that our funding will increase by about 191,000. So that's now built in. And we also know we want to reduce our planned deficit by 250,000. So all in all, we have about 3.1 new revenue as of right now where the act stands. We also are here that we could increase, increase the buy down to 180 million. So if they did that, that would be about another $34 per student that we would get towards us. So it's still up in the air. Down below for the potential and new expenditures, everything in gray is everything we've already committed to. So we committed to the new textbook adoption, the health insurance district portion, taking in the class fees. We're gonna have a savings on our internet and broadband because of all that work with E-rate that grade did as far as having to rebid it out. And then some, uh, we have some, it's just a year with additional licensing needs as they come up. So we have to add some money back to technology to cover some of those. We added some positions. So all of those are all already in the budget. Below that, where it says option one, are just different scenarios that we could run. So if we chose to give a 7% raise with a 9% hard to fit to the hard to fill positions like your paras, custodians, bus drivers, and we did the column movement, the sub increase, all of those things listed below there. That total dollar amount would be about 2.8 million. So that's the pie in the sky, absolute best case that we could probably hope for if we ever wanted to, to do that much. What I'm hearing from other districts is they're gonna be pretty bold with their raises because a lot of districts are getting a lot more funding than we are. Um, that mill levy match, some districts down here are just gonna swim in a lot of money with that mill levy match this year. And then with the SPED and all of that, they get more of that funding. So I think we're going to try to we need to be as competitive as we can be with raises, but we still have to be mindful of our bottom line. So that's one option. Okay. Um, that money that they're getting, will it be one time? I mean, it will. It will technically. It should be ongoing, right? But it it seems like it's more levy is on it's recurrent. Not the match, though. The Not match. the match. Yeah. I, I, my understanding is it's one time. Yeah. I mean, like, how can they be so aggressive then? If they're just paying down their fund balance. Well, they don't have such robust fund balances as we do. Uh, my, my previous stopping grounds do. Okay. But they're not getting a loving match either. Yeah. <laughs> so, yeah well, but we have heard of a couple of districts that are striving to go above next year here in the Colorado Springs area. Because <laughs> they're <based. laughs> As oh. always, you're right. <laughs> yeah, it's trending. Um, yeah, you're Fountain, joking. Fountain will go over fifty, but they're at forty nine right now, and they've always been about four thousand ahead of us on any sales. Yeah. Okay. So, so I will say the only we're reducing the spend at Broadmoor. <clears throat> What'd you say? How come we're reducing the spend at Broadmoor? Uh, caseload. Caseload will change. So we added that this year as an extra one um, because of caseload. And then after they ran the numbers for next year, they didn't need that one, but they needed more opinion Valley. So it's just a matter of shifting around for caseloads. Okay. 
Okay. So you're adding a half and taking it in there and taking a full for Bubba. In January, we added one, a full-time at Pinion and a full-time at Broadmoor at the mid-year, at the mid-year. Pinion, we weren't able, no, I'm sorry, we added a 0. 0.5 at Pinion and a full-time at Broadmoor. We weren't able to fill the 0. 0.5 at Pinion, but I budgeted for it. So now I only have to budget the other half of that. And then Broadmoor's went away because of caseload. Gotcha. So look, while well, the sixth graders kind of move up and they look at their numbers. <laughs> so I will say the only two things that I kind of get an earful from staff on, and it's the staff who've been around the longest. Um, when they look at the raises last year, and I know we differentiated quite a bit, but there is this sense of in the staff retention for folks who've been here the longest, they just, they want to feel rewarded for their service. <laughs> and the two things that come up are looking at the being able to pay for their um, education beyond the 80 hours. I keep hearing about that. I don't understand it, but everyone keeps talking about the M80. So I'm bringing it up again. And the other one is, in, you know, as you were talking about really looking at the spread across, is there, because of the raises last year, some very experienced staff who are now being, um, aren't making as much as some either newer staff and just making sure that we're looking across the board because people talk about salaries and they, they know how much people make. And so yeah. our more experienced staff feeling like they're being valued. The, the thing about that though, is your more experienced staff when you're giving an eight and a half percent raise is getting a lot more than yeah. that person making $40,000 at eight and a half percent. I absolutely hear that. <laughs> I'm just so, telling you that when people talk to me about raises, I think that's how it comes of, up. A lot of times they don't understand things like that. Mm -hmm. And so I, you agree with me? Correct. I do. Um, so agree. I find that I okay. do a lot of um, education and it's even just saying things like, I know, but think about how much your raise is on right. what your salary is. It's just like, because they, they just don't do it. <laughs> right. They go with 8%. <laughs> <laughs> so like that's not fair. Versus the right. actual dollar line. Right. Bottom right. line. And so that's like <laughs> one way that I think that we can help <laughs> people in terms of actually understanding what's happening there because they just look at that like that initial number and don't carry through the calculation for how it's actually going to affect them. The, the, the other piece that I've heard is that they do feel like other staff with less tenure are making more money. So I don't know how to spell that. I'm merely bringing it up because that's what I hear. So. Would, would a fact sheet that goes with what Natalie said, that be helpful, do you think? <laughs> <laughs> I think it's a communication opportunity and it's just looking back at those. Are we are we doing what we can to help our our veteran teachers feel like whether it's a number or whatever that they are being valued as we consider our raises? Mm -hmm. So I think that's a something to keep in mind. Yeah. And the other thing to think of, I mean, we can definitely look down that road of adding another column. It's going to inflate our salary schedule by quite a bit. And as I keep telling everyone, it's one pot of money. So <laughs> is this where you want me to put the resources or do we want to try to spread it out? Because we also have the recruiting issue of trying to get teachers in the door and, and the, the, the uh, younger first year teachers to come here instead of somewhere else. And yep. so it's, it's a dynamic of just trying mm -hmm. to, where's the priority to spread out the money. Then we hear about subs and we got to give more to subs and we got to do, so it, it's, we can look at anything. It's a matter of prioritizing where you want to spend your resources when we're already in our, our deficit and we're trying to be very mindful of bringing that down year after year. So it's, I mean, we can, anything's a possibility to look at, but there's only one pot of money. Yes. <laughs> and that, you know, when we add positions and we add things to the budget, that just takes away from it. So, so that, you know, that's where that question needs to be answered. I mean, our maxed out teachers are what make it, you know, got several or over more. 80. Yeah, I mean, that, that's pretty good. In fact, I have I have a couple that are over 100. Nothing worth complaining about. <laughs> really? <laughs> wow. Yeah, I mean, I think you got to balance think, that. I mean, teach, teaching is a unique profession in that that's one of the few where you've got two people doing the same exact job right next door to each other. One could be making 85, one could be making 45. That's, that's just super unusual. That's a good point. I think the other dynamic is the amount of education. So you didn't choose to get your 
masters. You know, you may not have broken past that. So <coughs> you may have been working side by side each other for 15 years, but that is a that's true. Rule. That's very true. Not to muddy the waters. I'm trying not to talk much, going but just to, I'm going. I'm not, <laughs> not going to muddy the waters, but I want to just clarify something about <clears throat> in the typical salary schedule, if you will, when you're early in your career, you're at that beginning part, and you're only maybe with a BA. That's the lowest amount, right? So if you think of like a chart, that's like the top left and the bottom right is many many years and highly educated. So to Natalie's point about you take a, a percentage like eight percent from someone who's making 45,000 versus 85,000, that is a huge differential. If there's one thing that we do have to be careful about is that year in, year out, we're not just doing percentage increases. So part of the combination of percent increase plus a fixed amount is gonna be key moving forward so that we don't end up having too much disparity <clears throat> relative to younger people coming into the profession. And I would say that actually that I would actually have greater concern about than adding on yet another educational increment on the high end, making sure that we're, we're in balance, right? So if you, in, in lieu of 8%, maybe you do 6% plus a thousand dollars. I'm just making that up as a, right? So, so that means that those who are more beginning in their profession, that thousand dollars represents a higher percentage than to someone who is further along. So you just have to be careful about that as we progress, that it's not always just a straight percentage without a fixed amount, or we end up with some unnecessary separation from our newer staff and our really, really seasoned staff, right? And that, and that will challenge us with recruiting if we're not careful. Yeah, and I appreciate that. I think that's the, the nuance, and I, I do think it's a communication opportunity um, whether it's the chart or whatever else, it just, it is, it is part of valuing all of our staff is helping them feel that they're getting something out of the money. Um, and you know me, I'm always a fan of spending the money. So <laughs> Another, better, worse. And I appreciate this scenario and being able to, to really look at it through the lens of, I mean, I, I just, we have incredible staff and we need to continue to re recruit incredible staff. We have a lot to offer beyond our salaries. And um, I think that's incredibly important as well. So this scenario just shows, I mean, this is the pie in the sky, you know, most we could do. You'll see that we're still not within where we want to be. That that gray box at the bottom is, is where we, we wouldn't want to go below the or above the 1.8 deficit. So in this scenario, we still be at a 2.2 deficit. So, but again, numbers are still early. They're still going through the School Finance Act. They could change. So that's just showing the, the big one. And then each one just kind of shows a different scenario with that blue box below. So the next one is just the 7% raised to everybody with no differential for hard to fill positions. Um, and you'll see that gets us to a 2.1 deficit. And the next one is a 6%, and you'll see that gets us down to 1.7, closer to where we would be um, as of right now. So just kind of showing you just how it can range. I mean, it'll come down to really the last day is my guess. I haven't heard anything today about how it would, no, no, no communications yet. So um, I'm hoping that they will increase the buy down because that will help. And then as we work through these numbers, some more we'll, we'll get them reined in. But this is it. I mean, I'm thinking it's going to be somewhere around that that six to seven percent is, is really what I'm thinking. Because also, I mean, this is our recurring expense. And so anything we do this year, we need to continue to maintain yes, right, for the next, next year. year and into the future. And yes. so feeding into our yes. So I don't have any answers or suggestions for you just kind of give me the range of what we're looking at and where the numbers are laying as of today and as you know it'll probably come down to okay we got a meeting to approve these now <laughs> do you have any concerns about those ranges with the six to seven percent is that it just kind of depends on where the school finance act will come in but to make sure there wasn't any concerns on your part before i keep this season our band together I just had a question. Are any of the departures we're seeing in the recent resignations or 
whatever way they're leaving our district. Are we seeing any trends that relate to some specific uh, items that we can address? Not as many retirements this year. Not as many resignations this year. Not that I, I know of, Randy. Today we had one come in that I'm questioning and I'm curious as to why she left. But all the other ones, you, I knew exactly. Like they were moving, they were out of state, they were retiring. Um, so I'm not seeing a lot of. I'm going to go down the street to make more money. There might be a couple, but I, I'm not seeing a lot of that. Not as many hires this year either. Yeah. Our new hires are down quite a bit, even from a year ago. Yeah, we're pleased with where our new hires are at right now. Um, in fact, I think I can do NTO in this room, which will make me happy. <laughs> um, so, I, yeah, I don't have any any good answer there, Randy, other than a lot of it is we know. We know they're retiring, they're moving on, they're, they're that type of thing. Um, It'd be typical transitional, a typical turnover. Up, right, of moving up to the next level of another district, you know, an administrator or, a, or that type of position. Thank you. You're welcome. We good on budget? Good. Yeah. Dr. Aldridge just got some new course proposal in the for us. I did have a question for Natalie. Um, thank you for paying the American Express bill for my travel, a hundred and some thousand dollars. A <laughs> hundred for American Express? Yeah. <laughs> What does that do? <laughs> what does that do? What do you mean? What is he saying? Well, where does that much go to American Express for? It's our purchasing card. So if we use an American Express to pay some of our stuff, we get cash back, so to speak. So our purchasing agent will put stuff on the American Express. Nice. Okay. I, I figured something must be going on besides my travel. <laughs> yeah, yeah, it is. <laughs> Companies don't take straight cash anymore. <laughs> so in the fall, we had about twice as many courses, but these three came in this spring for implementation in the fall and then the following fall. Um, Foundation of Production Design and Performance um, from the Fine Arts Department. But the, I think the benefit of this one is that we will add a CTE course offering. So one more opportunity to expand. Um, and I did talk to Ms. Brenner about the budget costs on the far right. She said she had it all figured out. That's all I needed to hear. I don't know what that <laughs> looks like, but um, she didn't seem like it was a problem. Uh, water ecology, quality and ecology was something that David uh, Ike approached the high school about. It's almost like Creek Club, but for high school kids with us um, working with saying a lot of the same people that he's uh, formed relationships with. I don't know if you saw last week, Lindsay Jensen did a story about the Creek Club at the junior high. Um, just a quick um, part of their Earth Day celebration. Um, so this would be an extension of that. Um, there's some grant kickback. If kids participate, they'll reimburse us for the cost. And then for the 24-25 freshman class, those kids will be the first that will have the graduation requirement for personal finance literacy. So we will need to change board policy next year to reflect that as an additional graduation requirement. They couldn't get it done at this this late in the year to be in the catalog because a lot of kids already had their track, so to speak, planned out. So that will be in place for the 24-25 school year. So kids that are graduating in... 2028 or 2029, I believe, we will have had personal finance course as a requirement. Any questions? So as far as uh, new courses, so it kind of seems like basically if the teacher wants to do a new course, as long as they're willing to run with it and run through the process, then that comes up as a course offering. 
I'm just wondering if there is any kind of top level look down as far as what's needed versus I want to teach what's this. Working? Not in my recent experience. Uh, I carry has a really close, um, uh, some of it has to do with how many FTEs she can have and their class load, um, which varies based on enrollment. So she looks at her FTE allocation and if, licensure. <coughs> sorry, licensure. sorry, licensure also um, within that staff. But so if they can, if they can carry a caseload that big <coughs> or not, and if they're qualified to teach it, um, there's not a ton of wiggle room um, unless we're talking about expanding like the CTE programming. That would be another place. The like uh, Mr. Smith was talking about Project Lead the Way. That's been expanded, um, but it wouldn't. The high school doesn't operate under the model of. I think I'd like to teach a period of knitting. Um, that it's not that liberal, I guess. Yeah. And these are all electives. They're not our core classes. So Except for not our. Um, Finance, uh, personal finance liter literacy that will be a core class. Be right. Right. We haven't voted on that yet, right? Nope. Okay. I, I, I just, that's what I was asking. Nope. I don't remember right. voting on that. So, they had to, okay. so the course sure. proposal, just, it doesn't change the okay. graduation requirement. It just gets it in the course offerings. Right. Right. And we have a year to discuss it as a group. Right. Because it'd be 2024. We'd be seeking for that. So the last time that I was on deck at at, sorry, SAC at the high school, um, when there were courses recommended by the parent group to the principal, it was the whole Project Lead the Way thing. And that was probably <laughs> seven years ago now. Um, and that was like a whole reevaluation of the science program and what kids were interested in and how we could get more um, dual, what do you call it, dual, dual, dual enrollments, dual, credit for them. Um, but since that time, at least when I was on the SEC, which was not this year, um, yeah, it's really been much more about, well, we have teachers who have this specialization that we never had before. You know, what do you think about offering this as an elective for science? And we just didn't have the flexibility because we hadn't had new people in so long. Um, but remember when, um, it was the guy who came from like Alaska and he was teaching. Yeah. Remember that? Like that Dissect was the first. Bear for a year. Yes, yes. that was the first time he had the yes. opportunity. Yes. Instead of blazing to lose everybody's money. Yeah, I remember that joke. Exactly. Well, there's no joke. Bring it into the school. Yes. That was the first time that we had the chance to switch things up a little because we had somebody who had different qualifications, I guess is what we're trying to say. Yeah, I was just wondering maybe if we could benefit from having a little bit more coordinated look through of what, you know, trying to correlate maybe what kids need versus just random hey i can teach this <laughs> <laughs> yeah, we now have a high cool. school great club <laughs> i think it's i think it is it's not random though i think it's like <laughs> what they're going to be interested in taking like they wouldn't have proposed this if they the creek club one if they didn't have a core group of people who are already interested in it and i don't see anything wrong with that process i'm just saying it shouldn't be just that right now, the junior high didn't have a process historically of this. So the high school has a packet. They take it to their academic senate um, department peer review, and then it comes to me, and I pull some people questions. And then typically I go to Natalie for the fiscal piece. But part of the junior, when we had three courses uh, proposed for next year at the junior high um, they had never done that before so we followed a similar process similar packet so to speak <clears throat> but then i said i wouldn't move anything forward unless they had collaborated with the high school because i didn't want the random kids take really cool things or not so cool things here and then the high school is not aligned so there was some 
well, art classes that sustainability has to just because one teacher can teach it this year and that a teacher's gone and no one can teach it next year <laughs> speaking right. which, can i assume we no longer person. have the beer dissection class <laughs> <laughs> say beer 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 i heard beer i did say yeah, beer that was, that was a <laughs> That was, that was the most <laughs> and, and not person dependent. Now, this free club, that would be a hard person to re replace with David Ike, but we also have other people in the district that are being trained to do that as well. He's not just the only one. Um, and although Mr. Smith would be, or Scott? Scott. Scott, Scott. Scott would Scott. be very hard to replace. The program would still continue. Okay. Any further questions, comments on course approval? If not, can I get a motion? I move the Board of Education to approve the new course proposals for the <laughs> high school as presented. Second. All in favor? All in favor, Randy? Sorry, I was muted. Aye. 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 All right. Stacey, hopefully you get to do these. Um, no. <laughs> I, I am F. Okay. All right. New review and revision, first readings. Give us the highlights because you can take it easy and we can do it more on second reading if you need to. Right. If there's anything really but important, I can help. pick, pick right, your favorite one. one. And talk about these, about these two are going to help me. On page 61 at the bottom. So the, the, whole, the, changes. The, whole, the whole bundle of first reads is predicated on <coughs> CASBY a couple of times a year does share um, updates for policies and they provide Obviously, the model CAS policies are a cornerstone of what we rely on to update policies. And this was a bundle that was distributed out to school districts in February. And so um, we just time time to get to the place where we could bring them for first read. Sidebar, um, just a, a source of continued frustration with the CASB as they still to this day do not have, uh, we do not have full access with our policies. So I think if that does continue, um, I don't know, there aren't, it doesn't appear that there are many school districts left that rely on CASB for hosting policies, but that might be something we want to look at down the road. We actually have quite a few school districts. I think. Do we? Yeah, like, there quite a few on the yeah there's like okay, yeah, I'm over 50 or something. Oh, there's over 50? Yeah, yeah there's I, a lot. I had, yeah, I thought it was a small so, number. Yeah. I got to believe then they're receiving a lot of concerns right now because right currently people in this school district could not see our policies. We are not public with our policies and I have already reached out. Um, so we, we can see them again, correct? We just can't <laughs> download them. They I finally got to where you can see, see it. Today I could not even see oh, them. Oh, they went back down again. Because we were able to see them on Friday. Yeah, we uh, could see them again. They, they were down again. So okay. just, just, a, just, a, just, so the bear, just so the board is aware, continuing to work on. The person that hosts them. Yeah. yeah. Have you heard from parents trying to look at them and they couldn't? No, but we've had a couple of staff members asking about policies actually and that's not true we have had a couple of parents asked too so we're, we're going to try to work on that i just um just know that that um you feel bad about it yeah i mean i know that you know i know because of the hosts but yeah. I mean, and i think it's also a reminder to us about making sure that we we maintain accurate records of all of our current policies separate of casby um, so, yeah. Would it be hard just to like <coughs> post all those PDFs on our own website? Uh, not impossible, but a challenge there because I'm not sure historical record keeping is there. They all link, don't they, yeah. to uh, legal references? Yeah, yeah, that's yeah. Right. Yeah. 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 So, just, just FYI, so this is uh, uh, ADDC schools. The main piece here was just the, the additional information that is deemed um, necessary for the Department of Education and of course legal references. Um, 
the contents of a safe schools report, this is, is pretty standard boilerplate. And so incorporated the E as an appendix so that that could be articulated. They recommend that that be uh, we're publicizing about what we're obligated to report. So that is that piece. Um, the uh, GCACBG, unpaid leave, leave of absence, year-long leave of absence, uh, working with Eric and Natalie, some adjustments on dates, and also just referencing now that um, recommendation, you know, the written request would go to uh, HR versus business services. I'm gonna keep moving forward here. Stop me if you have questions, please. GCO, uh, evaluation of licensed personnel. <coughs> the recommendation that we just need to make sure we're referencing in addition to whatever the Board of uh, State Board of Education goals are included. So that, that needs to be added. Evaluation personnel of GCO are the procedure. This one had just at the very uh, end of page, I'm now on page 72 in your packet. Uh, time limits in this section may be waived by mutual agreement. In essence, what it's saying is that if we're hiring a non probationary teacher and, um, and seeking to have uh, uh, an appeal um, that we can we can waive um, by mutual agreement that the time constraints to uh, allow for that appeal process. So we don't really encounter a whole lot of that here, in part just by our size, and I think quite honestly because uh, we do a good job on how we treat people. So, uh, JKA use of physical intervention restraint. I'm going to hand this over to Dr. Steen to help with the next series of things. Sure. So, um, so this particular uh, law has been on the <coughs> state law. We've always had the Colorado restraint law, and it was re it was reauthorized to be the Protection of People Act, um, and they did that um, via um, ECEA. So, so we, um, which is the, the special ed state law, um, and so this this particular law is really a protection for staff and for students. Many years ago, there was a four-on-one and a six-on-one restraint in a residential facility that killed a 15 and a 16-year-old student. So that's when the law was an asset. And so this law has gotten grown from, once it's, it's not willful, wanton behavior on the staff's part, they're protected under the law, and it gives the school districts the right to restrain if we feel like that's acceptable. With the caveat that we have to... Um, adopt a research-based intervention, which we do, which is called Crisis Prevention Institute CPI, and we have key people that are trained in CPI. So what this law does is it expands, it's more comprehensive now. So up until this law, um, the restraint, it was considered a hold up until five minutes. Once you hit five minutes, then it was considered a restraint, and then there are all these reporting policies that went into play. Now they're saying, that, and you have to, there was a report and you had to uh, notify the parent and so forth. Now they're saying that a minute, a minute to four minutes and 59 seconds is still, it's still considered a restraint, but it, it's not considered one that has to be reported, but rather the parents have to be notified of. Which you, any of us as parents, if our child was held for that two minute period, you'd want to know about it. So before this, we didn't have to do that. We did because most of those kids are in safety plans and it's delineated. If this happens, you'll be notified. And usually there are kids that have IEPs and parents know generally that, that happens. So it expands it to say, it's, it's we're going to call it a restraint because you are restraining a child, but it's not one that's reportable or that needs a definition of restraint. Um, so that's been expanded. Um, and so to me, implications of this is that we need to do more training of staff, that we need to train more people <coughs> on CPI, and that they understand how comprehensive this law is and, and the purpose of it. It's a protection for students, it's a protection for staff. That's basically it. Yeah. I have a question that's not about our district, but is it possible that other districts could be more... Um, 
like have more strict rules about restraint, mm -hmm. like so that like you can never restrain a child ever. Yeah. So is that the, something that the, happens as well? Um, well, they they could have their own internal practice or whatever, <coughs> but they define restraint not just as holding; it's also chemical restraint. So if you decide, well, little David, you know, he takes something for his ADHD. Today we're going to give him two pills because he's kind of you know. That's a chemical restraint. And there have been school districts in our country that have done that. So there's also, um, it's not a physical one, um, but you know, a neighboring district several years ago had their band around the student's chair, which prohibited that student from leaving his chair during the fire drill. And that, so those are the kinds of things that they're trying to just protect. So they may have more strict policies. We're going to follow this. Uh, we're going to continue with CPI and we're going to make sure that everything is documented and we're doing that. Because sometimes kids like try to run away off of school property. Sometimes they do. And then the other caveat is the, the concept of seclusion. Yep. So um, <clears throat> we do have rooms that children that use for sensory, particularly for our students that have autism, that they just need that sensory outlet and they just but the room under this definition cannot be locked. You cannot prevent egress. There has to be a window. It has to be documented about when the child is there and the parent has to be notified. So we're following all of this. We've kind of been on the lead of this. And this just expands it. So to me, the implications are around more training, more awareness of staff, and more communication with parents, which is all makes sense. Thank you. Do you want me to keep going? Yes, please. So, okay, JLCDC, so, medically necessary treatment in school setting. So, um, this one is brand new to us, and um, it's something that um, we we have to we have to adopt, and it's going to have some implications <coughs> with respect to um, just the training. So, what what the key part of this really is to to include that there's. Um, that there's no interruption to the provision of faith um, or violating confidentiality of students. Um, so we have students that, that are that are prescribed a, a, ABA, for example, or that they have a medically um, a, a condition that's a medical issue that they need some type of nursing services and whatnot. So what this is saying in the past, we've had districts usually say. It's our job to provide a free appropriate public education. Thank you very much. We do it via the EIEP process. Um, and parents say, you know what? Sometimes we need a little more than that. And why aren't you playing with us? Why aren't you allowing us to have folks in the school system, whatnot? So what this law does is it doesn't, it doesn't necessarily give permission for folks to come into our schools and whatnot. But what it does is it says the IEP team at their discretion decides whether that prescribed medical issue whether it's ABA whether it's the nurse nursing service or whatever it is that they look at that in terms of a fate can the school district offer a fate based on their staff personnel their nursing services that kind of a thing if yes this is what it's going to look like if the IEP team says we you know the medical we need more of that then then it can happen to me the implications of this is expand some options for school district and for parents but it also really looks at the, the making sure that the provision of faith is 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 a part of the conversation. So part of what this law does is it also says that medical providers have the right to access schools, but it also does this determination of um, as long as it fits within the visitor policy, which is really important to us because we do not want to disrupt instruction at all. And so our visitor policy is pretty clear that it's up to its principal discretion when they come and it's during non-instructional times. And we also are really clear that we're not going to take someone's recess away so that someone can observe them or someone's lunch away. So there's, it's pretty prohibitive of when that can happen, but it does happen occasionally. Sorry, another question. Yeah. So, and Susan, you might be able to weigh in on this. I thought last year that this law did not pass. So it did pass. And is are those restrictions that they have to follow the visitor policy of the district and that they have to be approved by the principal. Were those the like concessions that were made? Because I remember like, are we going to have to pay for these medical professionals and these additional no. service providers? Well, we can, we can say that a student that we feel like 
a student needs this and we can uh, uh, hire a consultant to provide right. that if we don't have the appropriately trained right kind of personnel. Yes. The, really, the three big things about, about this is, um, I'm going to start at the bottom, but but one is that they now include an appeal process. So if the IEP team says, or the, dis the district says, no, we're not going to allow this, that the parents have the right to appeal. So that's part of it, and that, again, is the parent entitlement. Mm -hmm. The other thing is um, <clears throat> it addresses the fact that we don't want to interrupt instruction. So it says you have to follow the district's visitor policy. Okay. And, the one, mm -hmm. and the one that's the, the most important is that that we give notice to a to a parent um, um, that's that section 504 ADA, which you know that IEPs are protected under there as well, or the students are to students to access medically necessary um, treatment required by the student to have meaningful access. And the people who make that determination is the IEP team versus a parent walking in and saying, I want this. Right. And, and and here's, here's my ABA the, person. Yeah. Right. And so what them. they did is they funnel it through the IEP okay. to make sure that there's a process, which is what y'all is a training implication for our IEP teams. They know that they can't, without the director uh, or myself, commit financially to anything via an IEP. That's just a big no no. That's We right. never talk about money, we never, that kind of a thing. Um, but we need to be prepared that if a parent feels really strongly about something that we that we listen to the concern, we address the concern, we come up with a plan how we can do this instructionally with our staff or contracted staff or the like. What we've had in the past is when we have nurses come in, it's really disruptive in the classroom. And so how do we do that in a way that we're not disrupting other people's learning and that the student receives the services they need? So this is second rendition with a little bit more. Okay, thank you. Yeah. If I could just jump in, Monica, <clears throat> the law as originally proposed um, was really much broader than it is now. And CASB lobbied heavily to uh, turn it down and to allow school districts um, the discretion um, that Carolina is telling us about now and that's contained in the policy. Thank you, Susan. It's it's not something that most school districts embrace though, but it's at least something that's doable. Okay. We do have right. discretion as Susan said. And it's not going to be disruptive and that's the goal. That's the goal. Okay. <laughs> Thank you. That's it for me. Uh, I, had a, I had one more question too, please. So are, are the classroom teachers knowing how to handle this kind of stuff? In terms of having, um, well, the restraints and things like that. <clears throat> yeah. So, so Randy, I do training every year on the Restraint Act, which is now called the Protection of the People's Act. But um, every year in every building to every employee about what their responsibility is regarding restraint. And so um, we're now now that it's a little, it's a more comprehensive. For all the training we do for the seat, the, the staff that are that are targeted to be CPI trained. Now we have a whole section on what the law says and what the responsibility is. And so we do not have people restrain children unless they're CPI trained. <clears throat> However, on occasion, we may have someone that needs the restraint because, you know, something bad happened to them. Um, as long as we are, it's not, you know, willful wants and behavior on the staff's part, they're protected under this law if they need to restrain a child. The important part is that we're, we're documenting and we're we have always done this, but we're really, really communicating with parents about the length of the restraint, why the restraint happened, who was trained to do it, how it happened, and anyone that gets restrained is going to automatically going to have a plan because they're going to need that level of support. So a lot more training needs to happen, Randy. Yep. Okay, thanks. Also, going back to Natalie on the budget, we heard at Broadmoor pretty significantly about one particular person. I'm forgetting who it was, that they really want to have stay. And I, I think I heard in your remarks that that person wasn't needed for caseload maybe. Is is there a disconnect between what they're telling us and what we're actually providing? So, Randy, the comments that were made at Broadmoor were around how FTE allocations determined. That's really more of their comments um, versus in, in who is – who was leaving Broadmoor and special ed was not that person that made the comment. No, there was just somebody in the building and I forgetting who it was. 
that they really were thankful to get, I think, mid-year. Yes. And, and are we able to keep that person there continuing as they requested? So what was reported earlier was that that the caseload is going to shift again. And so we have students that are leaving Broadmoor that that the director of special ed met with the team and determined that based on the caseload <clears throat> when the school year starts that they will not need that person. But if that changes over the summer, Randy, then we'll absolutely look at that again. Yeah. We base all of those numbers on, on caseload and numbers, Randy. So if, if there's a need, we had, like we did, like when we had to add the two in mid-year in January, it was because caseloads had increased and we had to add them. So we, we do look at those numbers when we consider that. It's just based on where right. the numbers are at the time. I but think they, they're you know, feel I think we were hearing they're all feeling overwhelmed. So any reduction of staff is going to be looked at negatively toward us is my sense that's how they were feeling that particular day yes but do know that we that we absolutely listen to them and i'm not i'm not i'm not and i'm not convinced that allocation formulas are the are the, how to do this in cheyenne mountain i came from a system that did that a lot we really need to look at the building their individual needs the impact that students have, what levels of support they need. Is it more parents? Is it teacher? That is a conversation to be had that an allocation formula will not get you. So at this time, based on what I talked to Karen about, that, that there's enough of a shift of students leaving that they may not need that level of support. But Randy, if over the summer we get a whole bunch of kids and they need that level of support, then they will get that level of support. Okay. I just want to make sure we're keeping the the pulse on what we're hearing and what we're budgeting. Thanks. Yep. There is a second procedural part, but I think, uh, I think Carolyn, you pretty much covered that as well. Yep. Yeah. Okay. So, um, and by the way, I guess Casby is back up for shine up. So yeah, yeah, I just went on and looked, but earlier today they were not. So, um, so an Instagram I should resend. <clears throat> no, because you still can't, They've been still can't download it, that, which is, Pardon Mike, you said, Monica, they've been more yeah. than apologize. Yeah, this afternoon there was no, couldn't access anything. Uh, LBD relations with district charter schools. This is a slight update and, rec and recommended update from CASB. But in the procedure, there is, um, so if you draw your attention in the procedure, a couple pages in on page 94 in your packet, you'll see additional language around criteria for enrollment decisions, which includes um, <clears throat> that there's a note on the district charter schools that give enrollment preference to children with disability. And I'm going to let you finish. <clears throat> yeah. And so right now we have, um, we've gone over, there's been, um, yeah. So, so there has been historically charter schools have denied access to students with disabilities. And what this law does is, is the, this policy is to protect to make sure that students with disabilities are considered in the enrollment process, that they can't be denied. And, and that's just a historic issue. We had it with our own charter school. Um, and so, uh, so, so we currently have had to adopt because the ECEA was reauthorized and it said that we cannot ask the question, do you have a Bible for an IEP? Can't do that in our enrollment process. So what's gonna be important about this is to make sure <laughs> that if we did get a charter school, that, that when they followed our enrollment process that doesn't discriminate or single out kids with disabilities or that have plans. And so that's what this is doing is to ensure that, that, that there's compliance in that. And I think that's a good, good thing. Yeah. Thank you. You're welcome. <laughs> no problem. That's it for first reads. Any questions on the first reads? Thank you. Second reads, I believe everything but by Jay. So Susan, um, Ms. Mello, if you could take a look at page 99, IJ, the blue was the addition based on your recommendation. I just want to make sure that the verbiage on that is uh, adequate or would cover any questions. That That is perfect. Okay. So all, thank you. Thank you for Thanks. that. <clears throat> all other so for the board, all other um, no second reads are exactly what first reads were. No other changes. Okay. 
Um, so I think we're ready to do uh, dates and announce meeting. And we do have a couple of questions about the dates. Can you do that? Absolutely. Okay. So we'll try to bring us home here with the dates. So a couple of a couple of things. Our current schedule. I know I had shared about trying uh, for us to remove the work session on Monday, June twelfth. But as I've had more conferring with uh, my colleagues and uh, including Natalie around budget, uh, not the salaries, but the budget approval process. I am feeling rather compelled that we bring June 12th back on the schedule. So mea culpa, but I think we're gonna just need that. I think Russ indicated he's gonna be out, but is there at least a quorum for the work session on June 12th? That's my question. Yes, yes. I'll be there. Okay. And that's going to be during the day, right? <clears throat> it's regular right time. Okay. Regular work session time. On the 8th, so now I'm going to go backward in time for a minute. So on May 8th is the work session. However, in light of just some of the discussion we had at our last work session, we've invited some folks who've been um, articulating a little bit with um, uh, junior high and Dave Strelo, myself, um, around just looking at traffic flows. Remember, we shared that little map, and we just have some concerns about that, so we've asked them to come and share on May 8th. Beyond that, I'm hoping that May 8th is also an opportunity for me to give you some end-of-year updates on the goals we've had for this year, so a little bit of that, too. That will probably consume our time for May 8th. The exception to that might be that depending on where we where um, School Finance Act falls, we may incorporate May 8th to be not just a work session, but also a meeting to approve salaries. Does that make sense for everybody? So that could be a possibility, and obviously it's a moving target as Natalie described, so we may not know until the 11th hour. If that can't work, and we need to go later than that for approval of salaries, we may add one of these board tours to have a quick meeting in conjunction or at the front end of a board tour, just so we have at least a quorum for you all to vote and to render a decision about salaries if we need to. Ideally, we're not having to wait all the way to our board meeting, which is not until May 22nd. <coughs> so, so just know that. There are obviously some other things in there with facility visits. We have the academic awards night, obviously graduation and the like, but please know we're going to insert back on June 12th for a work session uh, because uh, that's just gonna be something we're gonna need to try to tackle. Um, that's, I think, anything, anything else for questions regarding, and then our final meeting is June 22nd when we have in typical fashion, the public uh, comment for the budget and then the, the adoption of the budget. 26. 26, I'm so sorry, 26th of June. So any other, so we're gonna add back in the June 12th work session, any other questions about the current this year's schedule? Um, do we have, yeah. the, I don't think I see the retirement thing on here. Isn't it not? Oh, is it, no, it's not. Is it? When, when is it? It's uh, that's what we were though. Yeah, that's a good question. It's, Hang it's tight. The 17th. Yep, 17th. At what time? Um, 4 to 5. The formal program starts at 4 30, reception at 4. Okay. So and we're at, at the high school? Student Union. Student okay. Union? Okay. So May 17th? Yeah, high school. May 17th. If everybody got that, we'll add that one as well. Okay. Okay. Any others for yet this year before we wrap up for this year? Okay. So then also a very preliminary rough draft. I asked Liz to just share with you a rough draft. We noted a couple of dates already that were maybe not Mondays. Sorry. Uh, I think with all these policies, we were, Liz and I were running a little ragged on this at the very end. And I, I, I updated Susan April, the April ones, because those were wrong. So that we've got a new rough draft. It's going to be an ongoing rough, rough draft. But we caught that. Is anybody else have other things as of right now? I mean, I know we'll continue to change things along the way, but. Any other questions about this? I think 
keep my edits. These two over here are enjoying <laughs> cutting out <laughs> half, of, <laughs> half of the meetings. Yes. So for Susan, then this is the oh, Russell. This is the Russell <laughs> <calendar. laughs> <laughs> you gotta separate them. They're having too much fun crossing off part of the calendar. That's too funny. Well, we can, given the late hour here, we can uh, bring this back even for the work session. And, and maybe we have a little more bandwidth at the end of our work session on the eighth that we can look through. But if there are scheduled things or you want to just send it to us in an email and we can just start kind of tweaking on it. Um, for for them a few meetings through last year and the previous year we noted we're just like we combined like a work session a meeting together so we tried to follow that being mindful of like jewish holiday or with you know uh, the winter break or whatever have you so we just tried to do some of that but some of these dates are still left with question marks right september and december too or two months to look at exactly for situations are, like that yep they're both faced in there so yeah. okay. Thank you. That's it. Okay. All right. Meeting is adjourned. Thank you. Thanks,